Andrew is from a little company called GitHub. You guys heard of them? Uh, he's going to talk about your build server being on fire, which is never fun. So awesome. Take it away. All right. Thank you all for coming. Uh, it's a delightful Friday. Uh, it appears that I have brought the Illinois weather with me, so I'm sorry. A uh, little bit about me, uh, because this is all about me. You're all staring at me, so let's, let's talk about me for a minute. Uh, I am a software engineer at GitHub. I have been breaking production at a variety of industries and companies since 2004. Uh, highlights include being a pretend systems engineer, a pretend front-end engineer, and I am a polyglot programmer in that I am bad at every language that I write. So. Uh, that's me. Also, as you can see from my Octocat, I'm typically rocking a mohawk. Uh, this is the first time that I've been speaking publicly without a mohawk, so I'm really nervous that I don't have the awesome mohawk powers to channel to keep this moving flow, uh, quickly. So, that's me. Uh, before, when I decided to come up with this talk, uh, it was brought primarily around the concept that I learned at GitHub, but it's not it's about all the previous gigs that I've had. So when I started out, uh, I was working in a development studio. We were cranking out PHP websites, and we had uh, we were growing like crazy, and we needed a way to be able to start automating the asset generation and push out process because we were utilizing the greatest source control system ever. Dreamweaver. Uh, hands here, who knows about Dreamweaver? Yes? It's fantastic. I mean, what better way to handle control of files than to have an FTP connection directly to production? And if you want to work on a file, let's drop another file onto that server, and that'll somehow magically tell you that that file is being used by somebody else. And if you're really upset, you just delete that file, and now that file's back to you, and there's no more source control. It's fantastic. But once you start growing to a certain capacity, you don't have that capability anymore, so you need to come up with something else. And because I was the silly person who decided that we needed to have something better than Dreamweaver, I was automatically told, you're the one that gets to figure it out. So I decided to go to the next best form of source control, uh, Subversion. You know, <laughs> makes, makes people real excited. Uh, so uh, I started working on a building of systems, and I noticed that in that company and in every other company they're in, you kind of end up with something that looks like this. You get a variety of whatever your flavor of source control system is, plus whatever variety of automation system. I originally started on Hudson, which then became Jenkins, which then became blah, 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 blah. Um, and all of these particular systems were created and ultimately look a lot like this. For some reason, everyone has decided that their build infrastructure is not important enough to invest anything in, so whoever last touched it becomes the one who has to control whatever is going on, and well, if it works, then maybe we don't have to do anything to make it better, ignoring the fact that if anyone touches the wrong thing or if uh, someone manages to trip over a power cord, it looks like this. Uh, so. I noticed that that trend exists everywhere, and maybe we should talk about that. And when I got to GitHub, uh, I got to see some rather interesting shifts on that. So I work on the developer confidence team. Uh, we focus on the build systems, CI, all the fun bits about getting code from someone's computer, and verify that it isn't going to break production for all of you. That team is part of the development lifecycle team, which focuses solely on how you can get from local development, CI, deploy, the whole shebang, which is part of the infrastructure department because we can't have three developers in a row as a result of the acquisition. No, no joke? Microsoft developer, no, never mind. Anywho, um, so one of the interesting things about it when uh, we approached this at GitHub is that uh, all of our internal infrastructure is treated as a product. It's treated as important as all the end user facing components. We value the amount of time that it takes in order to get from one feature concept into straight into production. And the amount of pain that anyone get, gives from having a poor CI experience, a poor local development experience, a poor deploying experience, that gets magnified onto your end users because if someone has a paper cut feature that they want to release, 
uh, if they have to spend four hours trying to deal with a bad build server and flaky tests and a long deploy queue, that means that everybody else is still experiencing those pain points and then magnify that by the number of users and you'll actually find that uh, you're, you're spending more time Ignore that the pain from ignoring that build server is actually magnified onto your end users. And there was a fantastic talk that was given at GitHub Universe, uh, written by Sophie Haskins and was given by uh, my manager, Kelsey, uh, bitly link to go check it out because it's a fantastic talk about how you treat infrastructure as a product so that you don't experience all the pain that you've had in the past. And so, my team's focus is on building tools and services to create a cohesive product to make developers and GitHub confident in their code. I blah, 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 all of that out, but the basic gist is I deal with build servers all day long and try and make sure that there's a short queue time and that builds are determinant, deterministic and don't run differently from day to day. So you saw what everybody else is and I'm sure everyone here's build infrastructure looks like. Um, we have a slightly different scale of pain so here's our stats on what we do. We have uh, over 4,000 job configurations at GitHub. We have 38 different job templates that create those job configurations. We do 30,000 builds a day on average, uh, and it takes over 900 agents in order to go through that process. So instead of one machine that is janky, we've got a lot more, and when things go wrong, then we still have the same problems, it's just magnified tenfold, and then we get a whole lot of fun tweets about how everything is broken and we can't make anything go faster. And I wanna blame this, like the concept that everything can be fixed with just five easy steps. Solve your Jenkins in install with these configurations or this particular plugin or do all the things that are out there because it's great for you to get started with that concept and then as you get into larger companies and larger volumes, all of those things sort of fall down in new and interesting ways that don't really get addressed within, that, uh, within those talks uh, or within those blog posts. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so I wanna go over some of the ways in which the evolution of a build server and build infrastructure is created because there is no silver bullet to this problem. There is no one way to magically solve that. That's, that's why there's, we have this shenanigan. Is they go to there and then whoever just came up with those concepts goes away and doesn't have to answer the particular problems. So there is no silver bullet. Um, so if you're coming here to find out one answer to fixing the fact that your build server is on fire, um, I don't have it, so, bye. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, so we're gonna start at the beginning. Uh, the common structure that we have with this is you start out with your single Jenkins master, or I'm gonna try and keep this as generic as possible, but let's be honest, the vast majority is Jenkins, and I've had to fix way more Jenkins servers than I want to count, so that's what we're gonna do from the primary focus. Um, so you tend up with a single server to start with. Uh, that works for great startups and being able to run everything, both the master and a single worker on there, or maybe a multiple on a big ass bur uh, box. Um, my first configuration for Jenkins was one large desktop that was underneath my desk. Um, that was the improvement from the Cobalt Rack 4 that was sitting underneath my desk. That was the first time that I had a server literally catch on fire because the fan ended up burning out and then smoke <laughs> done. So. Uh, sometimes your build server will literally be on fire. Um, but eventually, as you start to get enough builds, you need more capacity, you move into something that looks kind of like this, where you have remote workers that are out on different boxes. Jenkins uh, operates in a controller pattern, which means that it needs to be the canonical source for all of the, the remote slaves that are out there, which is a problem, uh, because as you start to keep growing, and growing, and growing, uh, that's a lot. Uh, of machines for this Jenkins to have to configure. So, not to mention, if you're anything like my environments, you need all the things on all the machines everywhere because no one will use just one type of language, one type of dependency. We need all of the things because everyone wants their special brand of thing. So, uh, has anyone ever tried to run a build machine that has all of this running on it? Any hands? Yeah? Yeah, it's not fun. Uh, especially when you start dealing with Ruby that r that'll handle multiple versions in Python, you can use the uh, virtual end. Um, and then Go walks into this the room and says, you know what, 
I'm not going to deal with multiple versions. Only one version. If you want more than one, forget about it. I'm just going to break your stuff. Uh, and no one seems to want to upgrade versions. So you're now left with the question of how do you manage multiple dependencies and multiple languages and multiple versions and everyone's favorite bits. So the first logical response is to then move into individual configurations. Within Jenkins, you can utilize labels in order to split out your, your load. So now instead of having one kitchen sink for everything, you now have three configurations or four configurations or infinite number of configurations. And then you get the added benefit of not only having to have all these different configurations and the same amount of stuff that you're maintaining, but now you have to build something to maintain all of those different configurations, which uh, I've managed to do with Puppet. And I'll, uh, sh I'll show you my li my, the sticker on the bottom of my laptop that explains my, my love-hate relationship with Puppet. Uh, but that, uh, you've now just shifted all of the pain onto a different portion of the stack. Jenkins gets to hang out and not care, but you have the same problems. So how do we solve this particular problem? Uh, we don't, end of talk. Uh, what we do is we cry because uh, we have an additional problem when we're starting to deal with all of these different configurations, which is dealing with flaky builds, intermittent failures, and dependency problems, because now you have all your stuff put into different configurations. You now have a bottleneck on the servers that you have available for the different configuration types, and constantly having to monitor whether or not you have the right ratios for those particular configurations. So we're going to talk about flaky builds now. And for those who are unfamiliar with the concept of flaky build, it's a build that contains errors upon which rerunning a result gives you a different result. Uh, we get a lot of that. I don't know, does everyone have, have flaky tests? Uh, I get a lot of that. There's some reasons for flaky tests. Here are the common ones that I've experienced. The first one is time zones. Swatch Internet Time fixes that particular problem. DNS, can't solve it, sorry. P equals NP. Uh, so let's talk about race conditions. Uh, race conditions are pretty common when it comes to testing, and as an infrastructure side, there's not a whole lot that can be done about them. But if you do treat them as a problem for your your users, you can come up with some interesting solutions to try and remediate that and enable your developers to be able to overcome the fact that they have terrible tests. Uh, one of the ways in which we handle this is a system that I call Flaketown. Uh, I am the ringleader of Flaketown. It's a delightful carnival that analyzes everyone's problems and comes up with ways to ignore them. Uh, so what we do is we actually create, convert every failure that exists for every single job we parse the log output and convert that into a standardized JSON specification for every, uh, every failure. We then hash the contents, uh, because sometimes you can hash things, call back to yesterday's call, talk on denial, uh, denial of trust attacks. Uh, we hash that we, to create a unique fingerprint on every failure that exists. We then compare that fingerprint to a registry of known failures, and then if the build only failed because of that fingerprint, we'll overwrite it from red to green. But because we don't want people to just ignore tests, we then create an issue with the person who said, hey, this test is, not, is flaky, ignore it, to go fix it, because I don't want to have to deal with hundreds of failure, failed tests, because if they're just being ignored, then why do they exist in the first place? Uh, so this is one way in which you can bypass that, from a, treat it from the infrastructure standpoint to enable the developers to deal with that problem. But you're still left with workspace colli uh, collision, workspace con cross-contamination, and environment cross-contamination, uh, especially if you're in a kitchen sink situation. But if you're in isolated, it's slightly less po uh, potential. Uh, we have a lot of projects that have to have workspace reuse because of the uh, amount of time that it takes in order to bootstrap uh, .com in particular is over 20 minutes in order to bootstrap from a brand new machine. That's a really long time to have to wait for a build. If you're dealing with six hour jobs, that's not that big of a deal, but when you have a job that takes 90 seconds and 20 minutes to bootstrap, people get a little bit upset. So we're gonna do what everyone in DevOps does, just throw <laughs> containers at it. Um, we're, we're gonna utilize Docker in order to solve all of our scaling problems forever. Uh, so using Docker and CI is really simple, and you get to throw out all the Puppet and make everybody else deal with your problems. So install Docker on a build agent, make everyone put a Docker file in their repository, update the build script to run Docker, build and Docker run, and sweet, we're all done. No more Puppet, no more configurations. It looks like this. Sweet. End of talk. Nope. 
What about dependencies? How do you deal with the fact that you need to be able to run things like database and caching and search configurations? And I heard this one time that you're not supposed to run a bajillion processes within a Docker container. So what do you do there? Let's throw some YAML at it. Uh, we're going to utilize Docker Compose uh, in order to handle orchestration of all the individual components. You got an example of a, an actual application uh, that has a MySQL database, Redis, and Elasticsearch on top of another application. And now Docker Compose build, Docker Compose run, script test, and voila, everything is done. No more problems. So now it looks like this. Build agent consists of Docker Compose, which then deals with Docker. You as a build infrastructure person no longer has to care about any of these things. Unless you've ever had to run a whole bunch of Docker containers and build Docker containers, at which point you are now dying of old age waiting for something like this. If you've ever had to do an apt get update and apt get install as part of a Docker file build process, it takes a really long time. So how do we deal with that particular problem? Well, there are a couple of different solutions. One, you can create a base Docker image to use and then use that as a from. The biggest problem with that particular problem is that something's got to update that. So if you never have any changes, great. You also need to run a registry in order to store that particular bit. And any time that, uh, it, if you have a vast major, vast swath of languages and configurations, now you're dealing with basically puppet management only in Docker files, and we wanted to get away from that pain in the first point. Um, you can also store every previously built image so that uh, you can use the previous one, but then we start getting back into flaky situations, or we can utilize a layer cache. Hmm, how could we make that work while still keeping deterministic builds? Insert very bright slide here. Uh, there's a thing called golden image caching. It's the concept that you create a job that builds a Docker image that contains the pristine state of your application. You then store that somewhere, and then you modify your Docker build or Docker compose specification in order to use that as a layer cache. Therefore, you have a known good state that you can pull things from, uh, so you're only dealing with the differential between your branch and master. So here's an example of how we were able to take that exact same previous job, which took 114 seconds to do the Docker build step. Uh, we implemented golden imaging, where we added a cache from section to our Docker registry and tagged it. We changed our build process so that we would do a Docker pull of that golden image before we did a Docker build, or a Docker compose build. And as a result, image build time went down to two seconds. So our total build time from the pull down plus the build was 28 seconds. So we managed to increase the speed by 20, 75% while still being able to be pretty deterministic about our end results, which is pretty, pretty nice. So now we've got situations like this where we're dealing with a vast swath of Docker agents that have Docker Compose that deal with Docker uh, containers, and you just sit there and go, that's a lot of stuff. And more importantly, those things really get expensive. And even when you're dealing with workspace reuse, the real answer is to throw it all away uh, because your build agents themselves are still sticking around. So we've got two potential options here for ephemeral build agents. There was a fantastic talk yesterday about how to utilize Jenkins plus Kubernetes uh, from Mandy Hubbard. Go check it out. I am not going to talk about that particular solution today. I'm going to talk about ECS because thanks, Amazon. So one of the ways in which you can deal with this is uh, there is an Amazon ECS plugin that is accessible for Jenkins that allows you to be able to configure ephemeral build agents in your Jenkins files itself. You can specify the configurations, the, st the structure, and use pre-configured templates. Uh, Jenkins will then interface with Amazon ECS into an ECS cluster, and now it will spin up that connection. So now you have continuously rotating within your ECS cluster. The problem here is the capacity of the ECS cluster, and now you have to maintain whether or not you have enough resources, um, and if you're dealing with bursting, like we have for a large portion of the day, your cluster needs to keep going up, and then when you're done, your cluster needs to keep going down. So you end up with something like this, uh, and then the rest of the day, you're like, that's a lot of money. I don't really want to pay Amazon that much. So let's deal with some auto-scaling capabilities. Uh, and I like to not rewrite every auto-scaling system that already exists, so uh, I utilize the CloudWatch alarm plus scaling policy in order to make the auto-scaling group that's underneath an ECS cluster uh, 
automatically go up based on CPU utilization or memory utilization, um, and then go back down. So now we have Dockerized build agents. We have Docker Compose to handle the, the orchestration of the dependencies. We have stopped our determinacy problems. We have the scalability ca uh, capability for the resources that we run all of these on. We're done, right? Except the problem is, if you've ever tried to implement auto scaling, uh, scale in on an ECS cluster for build infrastructure, you will quickly find that it decides to randomly pick an EC2 instance to kill. Uh, which is a problem when that particular instance is in the middle of running a job. Thanks, Amazon. So here's the secret sauce on how to be able to manage this particular problem. It's a giant pain, but first, enable scale and protection on your auto scaling group that is out backing your ECS cluster. Then set up an, a, run, a scheduled task or a cron job or whatever you want that it has the capability of communicating with your ECS cluster. Check to determine whether or not you want to scale in. I'd say under 50% utilization of the cluster means great, we need to scale in. We then set one of the EC2 instances. I take the oldest instance so that I can continuously clean up the new configurations. Set it to draining. Then decrease the capacity of that auto scaling group by one. Then in a separate process, regardless of whether or not scale in should occur, check if there are any EC2 instances that are set to draining and have zero tasks. If there are zero tasks and it's draining, it's the one that should be terminated and it should, it's ready to be killed. Terminate that particular instance because you've drained, you've set it to draining, it's not getting new jobs. Because you've decreased the desired capacity on the auto scaling group, it will not replenish that particular EC2 instance and then it's terminated and it's gone forever. So you now have all of those lovely auto scaling capabilities, tacos for everyone. You've successfully scaled your company's build infrastructure straight to an IPO. Please collect your boat money and see yourself out the door. We're all done, right? Well, the problem is not everything can be run in Docker. I know, it's very sad. I'm pretty sure that goes against the DevOps policy. What about VM support? Uh, can't always have every build agent in there and every job sometimes needs to have things, for example, file system manipulation, AMI generation, um, when you're not utilizing Packer, you know, it's a shame when that's the case, but we still need to be able to come a solution for that type of system, bare metal, for example. Well, there's a cool plugin for Jenkins that utilizes EC2 agent scaling. It actually interfaces with your uh, AWS account to be able to use, instant, uh, use AMIs in order to generate build agents. And has the fun bit, if you're very frugal, you can utilize spot instancing in order to handle your ephemeral build agents. You configure it, specify your AMIs, which now means you have to start managing AMIs, AMI generation, which is now moving us back towards that puppet area and that configuration management hell that we don't really want to go back to. But if you really need the capability, you can have a mixture of the EC2 structure and the ECS structure to handle your VM level configurations as well as your do utopian Docker area. And now I have managed to ramble through fast enough that I am all out of things that need to say. I have a lot more. I actually uh, cut out like 25 slides. So if anyone has any questions, comments, concerns, things that they want to ask me, I would love to talk more because build infrastructure is rather interesting and making build servers not get on fire is fantastic. Thank you all very much for your time. Awesome. Do you want to take some Q&A real quick? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Raise your hand. I'll come around and bring the mic. One of the back. Uh, how would you manage uh, like upgrades to Jenkins and seeing that, making sure that doesn't break other builds? Painfully. Um, that, is, that is honestly one of the components that I, I took out was the pain points of dealing with deploys of Jenkins, especially within a Dockerized universe or within Kubernetes itself, uh, leads to pain points. The way that we've managed to handle that is uh, set Jenkins to quiet mode so that it stops accepting jobs, wait for the jobs that are currently in flight to complete, then deploy any sort of update to Jenkins without losing that job, uh, and then in that process re-enable quiet mode as part of our deploy process. Uh, it, that is one of the bigger problems of Dockerizing the Jenkins master itself. And where I, one, one approach is to have 
uh, blue-green multi-master Jenkins and reroute your jobs over to that particular area, but now you're dealing with multiple Jenkins installations and keeping parallel uh, parity between those two. Any other questions? Raise your hands. I solved every problem for everyone in this entire room. That's pretty awesome. Awesome. Give them a big round of applause, everybody.